Catherine Cargas is a mobility advisor with more than 30 years of experience uh, in consulting uh, in the areas of electrification of transportation. She's led Electric Mobility Canada as chair for six years and acted as president and interim uh, CEO. She works with multiple stakeholders in the industry, including vehicle and charging manufacturers, electric utilities, the governments and network providers. And you know, I know Catherine well, and uh, it's really great to have you here today, Catherine. Thank you so much, James, and thank you for, for having me. Uh, I think this is, I've been listening to the first two presenters and the information being shared is absolutely fantastic. So um, I, I, I'm really, really happy to join, uh, to join the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's great to have you. So I have a question here for you. Uh, we know that heavy duty vehicle electrification has a real pathway uh, forward for electrifying. What are the key areas that we need to work on to ensure that appropriate infrastructure is developed, that investment comes through and that it all falls into place as, as the uh, OEMs roll out their new electric trucks? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, uh, I mean, we finally entered a period where we can start to incorporate heavier electric vehicles into our mobility mix. Um, commercial vehicles, as was mentioned by Ahmad before, uh, comprise a category of motor vehicles used for commercially transporting goods or passengers. So I'm stating this because I want everybody to understand what exactly we're talking about. This category includes trucks, vans, buses, in 2018 alone, we had approximately 4.2 million heavy commercial vehicles and over 20 million light commercial vehicles that were produced throughout the world. So take those millions of vehicles and understand that the opportunity is enormous. Just to ensure that we're all on the same page, in the area of mobility of people, we're essentially talking about buses, transit and school buses, okay? Um, in the area of mobility of goods, we're talking about vehicle classes five to eight. So trucks of various sizes. And as we've witnessed, electric transit and school buses are commercially available and have been for several years. Multiple transit agencies have already started the transition to electrification. Multiple infrastructure paths are available depending on the routes and duty cycles. Here, agencies need to ensure that they assess the costs associated with each charging path and ensure that they are planning with tomorrow's technology in mind. That's the thing that we need to keep in mind. Agencies also need to be mindful of the costs as selecting some charging paths, as was just talked about, is significantly more expensive. This is taxpayer money, folks, and we need to invest it respectfully. Where we're seeing enormous promise is in the movement of goods. The average heavier vehicle generates multiples more GHG emissions than the average individual passenger vehicle. So the environmental savings are considerable. With Tesla and more established truck makers like Volvo, Daimler unveiling electric models, electric commercial trucking is getting increasingly atten more attention. But Charging infrastructure for these vehicles is underdeveloped. In Europe, for example, the European Automobile Manufacturers Association released data indicating that we need, uh, we need approximately 90,000 public charging points over the next decade in order to be able to transition to carbon neutral road transport. And the issue is that the charging points that are there right now are not the ones that we're going to need for these larger vehicles. Now to hit the 2030 target, Europe is going to require a fleet of 200,000 electric trucks. Just in terms of context, to let you know where we're at, there were about 700 medium duty and heavy duty trucks sold in Europe in 2019. So we're talking about many, many more that are gonna come uh, over the next few years. In terms of charging needs, Europe is going to need 90,000 charging plugs by 2030, like I mentioned, and 37,000 of them have to be installed over the next five years. And the situation is no different in North America, right? Commercial trucks can't use the same charging infrastructure as passenger cars. They're going to need bigger battery packs, they're requiring higher power stations and drawing more energy. Stations will also need to be designed to accommodate these larger vehicles. One of the first charging corridors for electric trucks in the world is the I-5 on the North American West Coast. This corridor is showing us 
one of the paths forward for electric trucking. Another model may be returned to base with vehicles never straying far from a central terminal. This ensures that they will never be far from a charging station. That's already how many commercial fleets are operating. At EVS in 2019 last year, Renault told everybody there that this is the target that they have in mind. These are the trucks that they will be, electric trucks that they will be developing, those that are returning to base. And why? Because the charging solutions associated with those are much less expensive. The number of applications varies and so do the charging solutions. We've got long haul trucking, short haul delivery, drayage services at ports, and the list goes on. Charon, the international grouping of manufacturers who are working on these standards, is talking about one to three megawatt chargers, people, for some commercial trucking needs. This is enormous. Most electric grids are incapable for such energy demands. So the kind of solutions that were just talked about by FreeWire may be much more interesting for commercial purposes moving forward. Already Daimler is organizing information sessions for electric utility representatives to inform them and help them prepare for their vision of electric commercial trucking. And Daimler is talking about needs over the next five years. Five years. Are electric utilities gonna be ready for such demands in five years? I know we just heard that maybe electric utilities aren't the best players for this, but I think they have an important role to play. Who's going to pay for this infrastructure? Ahmad mentioned earlier the finances are challenging. Revenue streams, at least in the short term, are not going to justify such investments. More than ever, we need private, public, private, and I say private twice because I think that's the proportions we're going to be looking at in the future. Colla these kinds of collaborations are going to be key. Governments can't afford to carry the cost of infrastructure deployment alone partnerships are going to be essential. And these partnerships are gonna to bring together government entities, vehicle and charger manufacturers, network providers, and electric utilities. And before I finish, I wanna describe a sustainable commercial mobility solution that we at Marcon developed for Propulsion Quebec, which is the electric and in intelligent industrial cluster that's based in the province. We describe commercial consolidation hubs that will be located on the periphery of urban areas. These hubs will be where heavier vehicles, trains, trucks, and other types of vehicles are going to be offloading their goods at consolidation centers, and the goods will then be distributed to appropriate lighter electric vehicles for distribution within the urban area. This will result in less of a strain on, um, on infrastructure within the urban areas. These hubs are gonna be charging hubs as well. So each hub needs to start being planned today with all stakeholder, stakeholders participating, including the investment community. And I think this is probably the, uh, the, the way we're going to have to move forward. Um, I don't have the solution, I just know that without collaboration, we're not gonna get there. Thank you so much, Catherine. There was so much in that. You know, I've just seen that the chat um, panel pop up of bunches of questions and, and thoughts that have just sprung from what you've had. And, and we're, gonna, we're gonna get to these in a minute, but uh, for, we've got some uh, audience questions now. So if you're in the audience, please take a look at that Q&A box to send Catherine some questions. And so we can follow up on that. But we, we do have one straight away. Uh, the, the transcontinental highways and railways in the past, initially they didn't make financial sense for governments, uh, just had to put the bill for the infrastructure so that that could actually ignite you know, this transcontinental transport. Can governments do the same or can, how, how does this happen in a public private part, public or private public private partnership that you mentioned moving forward? I don't know how it would exactly happen, but we're starting to see increasingly uh, governments that are investing in uh, infrastructure with the intent of eventually making money. And I'll give you an example. The Caisse de Dépôt, which is here in Quebec, is in the investment arm of the government of Quebec. And we know that the government of Quebec, at least in North America, is one of the leading governments as far as electrification of transportation is concerned. 
One of the things that the government has done is in collaboration with the investment arm, Caisse de Depot, which obviously is, needs to make money, right? This is, a, this is an investment arm of the government that takes the, um, the pension money of all Quebecers and invests it. And one of the things that it's investing in right now is the creation of an electric train here that will join that will join Montreal with the South Shore, the West Island, every part of the city. So what we're seeing for the first time is a potential model that could work. Governments are the ones that are trying to do what's in the best interest of the public. And we need to be able to work with um, governments in order to not only invest in areas that may not be uh, uh, revenue positive or profitable for, 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 these, uh, for the private sector, but eventually try to invest in ways that are going to create money for uh, taxpayers. And this is the model that the Caisse de Depot, I think, combines. It combines the investment side with the government side. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of these moving forward. Excellent, Catherine. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a um, uh, one very brief question to uh, to, to ask uh, before we jump into the next panelist, and uh, we're just going to do this one really quickly. Uh, how how does the U.S. And, and perhaps the Canadian market differ from others in, in terms of investment in e-mobility? I think that um, the U.S. market has probably benefited from more private investment than even the Canadian market. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you an example, a company like Nissan, uh, which has uh, invested in infrastructure both in Canada and the United States, has been a lot more active in, um, in doing so in the U.S. market. And it has done so in proportions that are greater than the 10 to 1 that we see in the population size. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the, the reasons may vary. I, I, I don't know what their reasons are, but we have seen that uh, the, the Canadian market could likely benefit from a whole lot more investment than the U.S. market. Um, and in the U.S., we have seen um, certain markets, even within the United States, that, that have benefited more than others. California, for example, has been at the front end of most mobility trends that we've seen over the last few years and continues to lead even in the EV space and in the infrastructure space. I know that we were not, uh, that, that we talked about uh, why uh, make ready may not be the ideal way to move forward. But right now in California, a lot of the electric utilities are using uh, this path for encouraging the electrification of, uh, of heavier vehicles. Um, I think we're learning. I think one of the, having spoken to some of the representatives from these utilities in the last few months, um, I heard that one of the things that they underestimated is the amount of money and effort that needs to go towards education mm. of this group. And I think this is something that we haven't talked about, but we are going to need to talk about. Uh, the more educated, the more likely we are to make the, uh, the more informed uh, investment decisions. Um, and even in this market, uh, the, the market that we're trying to target, uh, we're having a lot of awareness and education issues. And this is one of the areas that we're going to have to invest in more heavily. Are electric utilities the ones that need to be investing in this? Uh, should we be using other partners in order to be able to do this? In the case of California, would CARB be the ideal uh, path for delivering this education? I don't know. I'm asking the question. We're learning now in California. And I think we're going to base, uh, based on this learning, we're going to develop programs in other parts of the U.S. and across North America that are going to be much more targeted to the needs of this, uh, of this specific audience. 
Thank you very much, Catherine. That was, again, wonderful insight. So uh, thank you again. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have some panelist to panelist questions. So what what will happen is uh, I'll be um, I'll be introducing uh, the, the panelists and the, the person that they're asking to, and they're going to ask uh, that question a, a, as we move forward. Roby, I know you have a question for Catherine surrounding uh, fuel cells and, and battery electric. Uh, I know a lot of us have uh, that sort of uh, questions in mind. Uh, Roby, please shoot away for Catherine. Uh, thanks, James. Catherine, you know, in listening to the uh, your comments around heavy duty and particularly long haul trucking, I think we're seeing a lot more uh, attention being paid to fuel cells versus uh, a pure battery electric vehicle for long hauls, given the weight and uh, density uh, comparisons. I'm just curious to get your opinion and weigh in on, on who do you think the winner is there? Is it is it fuel cells or is it uh, BEVs? That's that's a really big question. You know, we're talking about the beta VHS thing, you know, like maybe all over again. Um, I don't have the answer. I, I think that battery technology is, this is a question that we've been debating here in Canada for a long time because the hydrogen industry is a, is a big, you know, is a big player in the Canadian space. Um, so my opinion is, you know, we've been at Marcon, we've been working with hydrogen technology since 2002. And we keep hearing that hydrogen, you know, like widespread hydrogen use is only 10 years away. We've been hearing about that since since 2002, you know, like when we started in this space. Um, I think that hydrogen applications uh, are going to be, uh, you know, are, 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 we're going to start to see a lot of them in the next few years. I think long haul trucking may be one of the areas where we're going to see this. But again, we haven't seen the end of the development of battery technology. Battery technology just keeps improving um, and the cost just keeps coming down. So if we could figure out, um, you know, and maybe the free wire uh, solution may be one of the solutions that we need to start thinking about. Um, but we certainly need to start looking at ways that we're going to charge these vehicles in an economical way. Um, you know, the kind of chargers that we're hearing coming out of Charon, uh, you know, uh, one megawatt, three megawatt chargers. I even heard somebody talk about five megawatt charger. I said, man, if I wasn't sitting down, I'd be falling off my chair. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not there yet as far as the, the, the capabilities of our electrical grids. Um, and so I think we're going to need to come up with better solutions um, because honestly, one of the things that we, I was talking about with James earlier this week uh, was, you know, hydrogen, one of the issues is the, you know, the deployment of, of infrastructure. And if, when we're talking about three megawatt chargers, yeah, we're starting to talk about that as well again. So um, we need to find more economical solutions. I know that Daimler, Tesla, and some of the others have this in mind, but is it a change of the way we do, we move goods around that has to change? Maybe we need more of those hubs and those vehicles sh should not be traveling more than, I don't know, 250 or 300 kilometers. That's what Renault is talking about as far as Europe is concerned. Um, but maybe we have a different opportunity here. You know, North America has really huge spaces. Um, you know, we're not talking about European style traveling. This is, you know, like very, very different. Um, so, you know, will we be looking at more corridors like the I-95? That would be, the I-5, that would be really interesting as well, but we need to come up with better solutions. And that's why I think that listening to Arcady's uh, description of his solution might be one of the ways that we need to look moving forward because I agree, it is it's gonna cost a lot of money. Um, and, and, and this is why I keep, I keep underlining, we need to think about tomorrow's technologies, not the technology that's in the vehicles today. Okay, so um, 
you know, and this is the, the, the error that I think many of us are making. You know, we keep looking at what is the technology that's out there now, and we're planning 5, 10, 15 years into the future, which isn't the right thing to do. We need to start looking at technology developers, start to, start to evaluate, you know, what are the, the likely uh, developments over the next five years and start to develop charging solutions around those developments. Thank you, Catherine. That's just really great. So uh, before we finish up our, uh, our time today, uh, I'd just like uh, every um, panelist here just to give their, perhaps their one sentence thought on, on what the direction is for uh, electric vehicles and their future investment and a key message that you would like to leave our audience as we take away. Catherine, what, what's your last word or last sentences as we leave today? Hang on tight. This is going to be a really, really quick journey, I think, over the next few years. We're going to be requiring investment, but we're also going to be requiring education. And I think this is the piece that's missing for, uh, as far as this industry moves forward. We need to educate the decision makers better. 